Hello everyone. Welcome to this exciting video on interview process full course by Simply Learn. Most interviews for companies have multiple stages. It could be verbal, language testing, personality profiling, as well as technical tests. This video focuses on the best ways to improve your interview process that will help you increase your chances of getting hired. Before we look at the agenda for today, please make sure to subscribe to the Simply Learn channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from us. So we will start with the most basic topic that is how to introduce yourself in an interview. Then we will see some of the crucial resume tips for freshers followed by understanding the important interview tips for freshers. Next we will look at the top 7 telephoning interview tips including the tips to master group discussion. Moving further we will learn the top 10 interview questions and answers and understand how to answer a common question asked in the interviews that is where do you see yourself in 5 years. You will get an idea about appraisal meeting tips and top 5 soft skills for 2021. This video will make you understand how to choose a career and how you can get started with coding. Finally, we will see the best coding interview questions and answers. So let's begin. As the saying goes, first impressions are the most lasting. It is applicable for job interviews as well. So how do you make a positive first impression on the recruiter? Well, that can be done with the help of a well-prepared self-introduction. Today, we bring you this informative video on how to introduce yourself. It is essential to know the do's and don'ts while introducing yourself in an interview as your self-introduction decides how your interview will proceed. There are chances that a poor first impression can wreck your job opportunity. Before heading to the outline that we have for you, let us understand what the interviewer wishes to see in your self-introduction. Remember, no recruiter is interested in knowing about your personal life. Hence, keep the answer strictly professional. In a nutshell, through your self-introduction, the interviewer tries to understand if you are a good fit for the job and for the company. In addition to this, your experience, your confidence, communication, and social skills are also highlighted. Your self-introduction plays an important role in how the interviewer perceives you as a candidate. You might wonder why a self-introduction is necessary when the interviewer has your resume. It is necessary as recruiters would like to directly hear you talk about yourself and see how well you present yourself. So if you are asked to introduce yourself or talk about something about yourself or asked to walk the recruiter through your resume, here is an outline of how you should frame your answer. One, start your introduction with a greeting following which you can also choose to thank the interviewer for the opportunity given to you. The first part of your self-introduction should be about who you are. You can say, my name is Josh, or I am Linda, if the interviewer hasn't taken your name already. You can then mention the name of the place of your residence. Two, without elaborating more, move on to talking about your educational background if you are a fresher. Mention the name of your educational institution and the degrees you hold. If your CGPA is really good, you can state it. Otherwise, it is fine to refrain from talking about your scores. You can also briefly mention the project you have done and try to relate it to the job that you are applying for. On the other hand, if you are an experienced professional, start by speaking about your current or latest job role. Mention the name of the company, your designation, and your tenure. You could also list the key responsibilities you carry out and provide a snapshot of your work. Feel free to mention any work accomplishments you have gained that is not on your resume. However, these achievements should hold some proof. It is imperative that you sound enthusiastic, not simply boastful. If possible, you can use adjectives like team player, problem solver, creative, and so on. Remember to keep it short and crisp. Moving on, you are free to speak a line or two about your hobbies and passions. If you are a fresher, you could also mention the co-curricular activities you have carried out. This section can accentuate your personality on the whole. Finally, the last part of our outline is the closing statement. This is something very crucial which candidates often miss out on. Here you must concisely explain why you are applying for this job and how you feel it aligns with your future goals. You could speak about how fascinating the company is and that you are ready for a challenging assignment and connected to the job description. 
Here, you can also mention the core skills or certifications you possess and how you can apply it in this job. Listening to this section, the interviewer should feel that you will be an asset to the company. Finally, you can conclude your self-introduction by saying, that's all about me, thank you. So those were the points to keep in mind while framing your answer. Customize your answer based on your educational background, achievements, work experience. It is advisable to jot down the key points and practice before your next interview. This way, you will be stress-free when you give a self-introduction on the day of the interview. However, do not recite your answer like a robot. Instead, while introducing yourself, be comfortable, at ease, and have a natural conversational tone. It is okay to make small grammatical errors when speaking as mistakes do happen, but make sure to be confident and maintain eye contact with the interviewer. Self-introduction should be brief, and ideally it shouldn't go longer than a minute. So the next time you're asked to introduce yourself in an interview, you know how to ace it. Following these tips will help you create a good first impression. Are you ready to apply for your first dream job? The first step to get there is to have a well-crafted resume. Resumes are the first point of contact with recruiters. Only if your resume is impressive will you make it to the interviews. Resumes speak volumes about you to the hiring panel. A resume is a document that highlights your career goals, education, skills, achievements, and interest areas. Hence, it is of utmost importance that you package your resume well to get shortlisted by HRs. You barely have six to seven seconds to create a positive impression with your resume. Here are the top 10 tips that will help you craft an impressive, fresher resume. One, first and foremost, you need to pick the right type of resume before filling in your details. Since you are a fresher, you should go with a format that emphasizes more on your skills. Hence, as a fresher, you can go with a functional resume. Two, our next tip to you is to have a blueprint of your resume. It is wise to pre-plan and organize the resume content. This way, you will better understand what needs to be in the resume and what can be omitted. Three, before you fill in your resume, be sure to add your contact information. This includes your name, your address, your email ID, and your phone number. You could also add your LinkedIn profile link for better credibility. Now with many interviews happening online, you can also mention your Skype ID. Make sure that every detail you give looks professional. Four, the next point to keep in mind is to have an impressive, short, and powerful headline. Resume headlines give an overview of your background to the recruiters. Hence, craft a good two to three liner summary about your career goals and qualifications. You could also add some relevant keywords from the job description to capture the recruiter's attention, which will help you stand out from the rest of the candidates. So here's a small task for y'all. Can you craft a very short one or two liner impressive sample headline that will go on your resume and drop it in the comment section below? Let's have a look at how creative all of us can get. And this will also help us get ideas from one another. Five, since you are a fresher, the next step is to highlight your education. Have a table and list down your educational details, including the time in reverse chronological order up to your 10th standard. You would also need to mention your CGPA or your percentage in a separate column. Make sure to align all these details in your table. Below this, you can also have a section for your additional education details and mention the certifications you possess in any presented papers. Six. Now it is time to highlight your skills. Choose a set of technical skills and soft skills that you possess, and at the same time, those that are relevant to the job role you are applying for. Again, you can sprinkle a few skills that are mentioned in the job description. While listing your skills, it is wise to use a two-column format that names the skill and your level of experience with the skill. Seven, since you are a fresher, you might have little to no work experience. Hence, add your internships and project details instead. Mention the duration for the same and list out a few points as to what you did. Make sure to keep it easy to read and structure the content in the form of bullet points. Eight, our next tip for you is to add a section that throws light into your co-curricular activities. Here, you can briefly list down points about hackathons, college fests, sports, and so on. This displays your passion and shows that you are an all-rounder. If you have hosted events or activities, feel free to mention those as it will display your leadership skills. Here, you could also mention your hobbies and interests. You can also add a miscellaneous section mentioning the languages you know and any other accomplishments you are proud of. 
9. Another rule to keep in mind while crafting your resume is to be honest. Ensure you don't add false information, as it will leave a bad mark on your profile forever. As a fresher, it is advised that you keep your resume within two pages, and not more than that. A simple, short, and crisp resume will do the job. On that note, here's a sample resume structure. If you want a detailed resume that can help you grab your dream job, please share your email in the comment section below and we will send it over to you. 10. And our last tip to you is to proofread your resume. Nothing can be worse than having typos or grammatical errors in your resume. Check for spelling mistakes and sentence structure. Having such errors will leave a bad impression on the recruiter and you might seem careless. In addition to this, make sure your resume is well formatted and you use the same font type throughout your resume. After carrying out all these checks, remember to share only the PDF version of your resume with the recruiters. So, those were our top 10 resume tips for freshers. It's no secret that all of us get anxious before giving an interview. However, your confidence boosts up when you prepare for the interview well. Even the smartest job seeker needs to prepare well, so here we are to help you with that. Apart from your technical questions, many questions are asked which can make or break your future. These questions might seem easy, but they are not. And the answer to these can be tricky and do more harm than good. So the better prepared you are, the more successful your interview will be. This video will help you understand what an interviewer is looking for in your answers teach you to answer interview questions and convince the hiring manager that you are a good fit for the job. So first and foremost, before you step into the interview, make sure that you have carried out good research about the company. This will help you get an insight into what the company is all about and helps you answer better. Doing your research beforehand will also make a much better impression on the hiring manager. You can start by visiting the company's website. Have a look at their service, mission statement, and the company's culture. You can also glance through the company's social media accounts. Additionally, you could also use Google News to stay updated with the company's current situation. The next point is to keep in mind to ensure that your skills are aligned with the job description. It would be good if you understand what the employer is looking for. Think about examples from your work history and match them with the requirements. This will make it simpler for the employer to understand that you are a good fit for the applied job role. If in case you lack any of the required skills, you can mention that you are working on it and in no time, you will master it. On the day of the interview, make sure that you are dressed professionally. Be comfortable in your attire and it is advised that you look at the company's dress code policies. You can also choose a professional outfit like business casual, formals, and a comfortable pair of formal footwear. You need to look presentable. Our next tip is to have good body language. Body language is also another way of communication. When you walk into the interview room, confidently greet with a firm handshake and eye contact. While you take a seat, keep in mind to sit up straight. You must have good posture and not slouch. Speaking of gestures, try not to touch your face too much. Avoid a tense impression with your hands and keep your hands on your lap or the table. Hands on the table and a gentle lean will emphasize that you are listening carefully. Your body language should be very respectful. Be aware of your movements and stay calm through the course of the interview. Now, let me brief you on answering a few of the most frequently questions in an interview. Number one, tell me about yourself. This question is asked to gauge your confidence and communication skills. Here, you can speak about education, experience, and hobbies. Make sure to have a concise answer and answer with enthusiasm. Two, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Through this answer, the interviewer wishes to see how positive you think about yourself and if you can identify your weaknesses. Speaking about your strengths, there's no right or wrong. It can be about your flexibility, your attention to detail, and so on. However, speaking about your weaknesses, you don't have to be hard on yourself. You can reply with an answer like, your attention to detail trait can sometimes be a disadvantage, and you tend to spend more time. This way, your weakness still has a positive side. 3. Where do you see yourself in the next 5 years? This question can be a little tricky. Through this question, the interviewer is analyzing your commitment to the company. An ideal answer to this would be to tell how you wish to be a significantly higher position in the future and learn new things. 4. Why should we hire you? When answering this question, do not speak about how good your academics are. Instead, speak about how eager you are to learn. And hence, the opportunity would be a good one to show your zeal. 
You can also touch upon a few qualities that they have that will be highly beneficial for this job. You can also list a few positive impacts you have made in the previous organization and how you can bring those here. Five, finally, the interviewer might conclude by asking you if you have any questions for them. Always make sure to ask good and relevant questions. This displays the seriousness you have towards the job. Ask questions regarding opportunities for your professional development in the particular job role. It is important to know that this is for your personal growth. Based on this, you can decide if that particular job is a good choice for your career or not. These were a few of the commonly asked questions in an interview. Whenever you are asked a question, it is good to pause and think about it before responding. Make sure your answers are concise, to the point, and honest. If there comes a confusing question, do not hesitate to ask more clarification. Given the current scenario with the ongoing pandemic COVID-19, everything is digital. That applies to interviews as well. Many companies are currently taking virtual interviews for hiring purposes. A virtual interview takes place remotely over video conferences. In addition to the already discussed tips, let's have a look at a few more tips that can help you carry out your virtual interview smoothly. Firstly, have a good internet connection which can facilitate video conferences. It is advised that you are familiar with the platform on which that interview is carried out, like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, etc. By doing so, you won't have to be worried about the platform's technicalities on the day of the interview itself. Next, make sure that you are seated in a quiet place. Eliminate any potential interruptions on your end before the interview. Have a good set of microphones to have a clear audio quality. While talking, make sure to look into your computer's camera and not the screen. In case of any network issues and lags, make sure you politely ask the interviewer to repeat the question and politely repeat your answer if you are asked to. Telephonic interviews mark the beginning journey of your interview process. It is a crucial decision maker as it is a filtering round. There are chances of you losing your dream job because of an unrehearsed telephonic interview. Currently, with the ongoing pandemic, audio and video interviews have become the need of the hour. Hence, it is important to be prepared for a telephonic interview at a moment's notice. This video on the top seven telephonic interview tips will acquaint you with the do's and don'ts while giving a telephonic interview. You can use these tips to ace your next telephonic interview. These tips can also be applied to your video interviews. Before diving into the tips, let's recognize what role a telephonic interview plays in the hiring process. Employers use telephone interviews to identify the right candidate for a particular job role. Recruiters call candidates who have impressive resume to understand if they are the right fit for the job. Telephonic interviews make the screening process easier by shortlisting a handful of applicants from an entire pool of applicants for the in-person interviews. Having a telephone call or a video call makes it relatively quick to determine whether a candidate is suitable or not. For a remote position, a telephonic interview may be the only way. Sometimes, telephonic interviews are also held because of other geographical barriers or situations like the current pandemic. Hence, it is advised that you are prepared for a phone or video interview at any given time. If your telephonic interview goes well, Congratulations, you will move on to the next stage of the interview. Otherwise, things are unlikely to progress. Telephonic interviews usually last for 30 to 45 minutes or even less. You have a short time to positively impact the recruiter and convince him or her that you are the right fit for the job. So, here are a few tips to help you crack your next phone interview. Our first tip to you is to understand the job description well and research about the company. Ideally, you would have done this while applying for the job. However, it is good to brush up on that knowledge before your telephonic interview. Suppose you know the name of your interviewer beforehand. In that case, it will be great to search him or her on the internet to understand the interviewer well. Next, choose a good spot to give the interview. In most cases, you will be informed of the date and time of your interview well beforehand. Use this to your advantage and choose a room where you can speak without any disruptions. Make sure you don't witness any TV, traffic, or any other noise. Additionally, keep your family members aware of your interview so that there is no disturbance from their end as well. After choosing your ideal spot, make sure that you use a good phone with good connectivity or preferably the landline for your telephonic interview. At no point should there be any call drops or poor network coverage at this time. Sometimes, virtual interviews take place over various other platforms like Zoom, Hangouts, etc. At such times, make sure to have a strong internet connection. 
and get familiar with the platform before the interview. While giving your interview, make sure that you're not eating or drinking. Yes, you can have a glass of water kept a sip if your mouth gets dry while talking. Our third tip to you is to keep a hard copy of your resume ready before you. This will help you recollect what you have on your resume as a reference. Usually, interviewers would keep looking through your resume while taking virtual interviews. Hence, make sure that you have one before you. Do have a well-prepared resume and remember your resume would be the factor that will decide if you get a phone interview or not in the first place. You can also keep a pen and paper handy to take down notes during the interview if required. Next, telephonic interviews also allow you to show that you are a good listener too. You don't have to keep ranting, interrupt, and dominate the conversation. Instead, let the recruiter guide the conversation. Listen carefully and answer the questions asked. You don't need to talk a lot to impress the interviewer. At any point, if you have any questions, you can jot them down and save them for the end. Make sure to wait and think before you start answering a question. Once the interviewer asks you a question, give a second or two and then answer. Also by doing so, you both won't end up talking all at once, which will sound chaotic and can be awkward. Our fifth tip to you is on how to answer your questions. Make sure to be thoughtful and concise with your answers. As we mentioned before, you have only a short time to impress the interviewer with your answers. So prepare your answers well beforehand. You can watch our video on top 10 interview questions and answers to ace this section. While answering your questions in a telephonic interview, the tone matters a lot. You must display enthusiasm in your voice. It is advised that you smile while answering. Yes, it may seem odd as nobody will see you smile, but if you smile, it will bring a positive tone to your voice. And you will seem to be more energetic and enthusiastic. Make sure you don't speak like a robot in a monotonous way and seem disinterested. Focusing well on telephonic interviews can get tougher on the phone than in person. Hence, do not get distracted and stay alert. Display good communication skills and language skills to move ahead in the interview. Our sixth tip to you is to dress well for the interview. Dress as you would for your face-to-face -face interview. This way, you will develop more seriousness in you and you will not take telephonic interviews lightly. Keep in mind that this is still an elimination process and hence, there should be no scope for negligence. If you are going to give a video interview, then make sure you are very careful about your dressing and come across as professional to the interviewer. Along with dressing well, your body language also matters in both audio and video interviews. It is but natural if you don't sit up straight and take the interview. You might slowly seem lethargic. Hence, make sure to sit up straight and take the interview as you would for a face-to-face -face one. Our last tip to you is on how to conclude the interview. When the interview is over, you can ask the questions you have jotted down during the interview, after which make sure to say thank you. In some cases, it is also advised that you send a short thank you note to the interviewer a day after the interview and provide any information that you didn't get a chance to mention during the phone interview. In most cases, there will be a follow-up from the recruiter's side, so give them some time to get back to you with the result. So, those were our top seven tips to help you ace your next phone interview. Spending a lot of time talking on the phone needn't help you master a telephonic interview. Hence, carry out a mock telephonic interview and incorporate the tips we discussed. This way, you will be stress-free during your real telephonic interview. As they say, practice makes a man perfect. Remember to give telephonic interviews the same importance as you would for a face-to-face -face interview. We hope these tips are helpful to all you job seekers out there. Group discussion is a crucial round in any interview process. Whether you are applying for your dream job or trying to get into the top tier colleges, group discussion is undoubtedly one of the eliminating rounds that you need to face. Many candidates panic about group discussions, but not to worry as we have a few important tips to help you crack your GD. Before listing our tips, let's understand what a group discussion means. In short, GD is a process in which a group of people sit together and discuss various aspects of a given topic. In the meanwhile, the GD panel will be gauging you on a set of criteria. So what are you tested in on a group discussion? What does the interviewer wish to see? The panel evaluates your leadership skills, listening skills, confidence, and teamwork qualities through a group discussion. 
In addition to these qualities, they also wish to see how well you can logically present your perspective and how gracefully you can conduct yourself in a group. The GD round strains the right candidate from a large pool of applicants. So here is a list of the top eight tips that will help you master group discussions. One, before you participate in a group discussion, it is advised that you have some knowledge on the given topic. Yes, you cannot be aware of every topic under the sun. However, there are a few general GD topics that you could research on. A few such topics are, women make better managers, agree or disagree? Social media is a boon or a bane for the society. Your views on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Given the current scenario, you can also prepare on topics around COVID-19. Topics like coronavirus, impact on global economy, how effective virtual learning is, and is social distancing the new norm? To name a few, different topics can be given to you, starting from general topics, to controversial, to case studies. Before stepping into the GD, research on a few topics that are frequently asked. You don't need to carry out a detailed study on these topics. It is enough if you have a rough idea about it. In the end, you are not judged on your knowledge, but on how wisely you present your answers. Two, next, we will speak about how you should initiate a group discussion. Many of you might think if you speak first, you can grab the attention. Well, yes, you definitely can. However, it can also backfire on you. Our tip to you is that speak first only if you have meaningful information on the topic. You could start the discussion with a relevant quote, story, or fact. If you are confused about the topic and unsure how to start, it is fine to wait and listen to the others and then rephrase your answer. Three, once the group discussion is in full swing, be careful about how you speak. There will be many candidates with different views. You need to respect that and assertively put across your view, but not aggressively. At no point should you shout and get angry. There are a few phrases that can help you respectfully communicate your opinions. Firstly, if you disagree with someone, be graceful and control your emotions. You can use phrases like, I beg to differ, I do not support your point of view, I have a different opinion, and so on. In situations where you agree with someone, use phrases like, I second you, I have the same opinion. Apart from this, there will be scenarios where you might partially agree with someone. At that time, it's best to say, you are right, however, I don't fully endorse your statement, and so on. At some point, if you are required to interrupt someone, think before you do that and say, sorry, I wish to interrupt you there. Lastly, if you would like to add a few pointers, you can start the conversation by saying, in addition to that, you must use the right words and phrases through the course of your GD. This shows you respect the other person and your flexibility in accepting others' points of view while sticking to your own. Remember, you have a positive attitude throughout the discussion. It is important to carry out a healthy discussion. Group discussion is not a process to judge your current affairs knowledge, but evaluate your interpersonal skills and behavior. Four, using the previously mentioned phrases allow you to speak. Hence, it would be best if you spoke with clarity and put across your opinions. Communicate confidently, have a good command over English and speak comfortably. Take a pause and think of what to talk. Do not try to be dominant while speaking. Finally, everything boils down to how you present your opinion and how well you can convince the rest of the candidates and leave a positive impact on them through your speech. Remember to talk well and catch the attention of the panel. Another point to remember is not sitting back after talking once. Try to have more than one entry. Five, our next tip to you is to listen carefully. Not just hear, but listen. A vital skill the panel judges you on is on your listening skills. Listening is a sign of respect. Do listen to understand your teammates and not just to reply to them. This may sound easy, but it is one of the most challenging tasks to carry out in a group discussion. Listen carefully and then reply. Give others a chance to talk. Make eye contact with the speaker and acknowledge him or her by nodding your head. This shows your active participant in the discussion. Six, 
Body language also plays a prime role in a GD. The panelists notice the way you sit and react. Body language speaks volumes about you. Hence, sit straight, avoid constant impatient or tensed movements. Stay calm and maintain eye contact always. You should also remember to dress professionally and be presentable. Seven, do not deviate from the topic. Focus on the content rather than the length of your speech. Group discussions also provide you with an opportunity to display your leadership skills. Suppose the group is drifting away from the given topic. Take an interest in helping the group stay on topic and head in a positive direction. Having said that, it is not your role to be the interviewer. However, make a conscious effort to have the group stick to the topic. Eight, summarizing or stating your conclusion gives a good chance to grab the panel's attention. Our tip is that you summarize the entire discussion and highlight the key points. Try to find the middle ground and do not have a one-sided summary. Keep the summary short and relevant. So those were our top eight tips to master group discussions. Make sure you follow these tips and put them to practice to ace your next group discussion round. You can research various GD topics, improve your language and communication skills. You could have mock group discussions with your friends and family. This way, you will have a good experience, be more comfortable and confident while participating in the real group discussion. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Do you think you are well prepared for your next interview? You surely might be with your subject. However, a few other common questions asked by an interviewer seem easy but are a little tricky. This video on the top 10 interview questions and answers will help you strategically craft an apt answer for each of these questions and help you answer them smoothly. It is not necessary to memorize these answers. Still, it is advisable to build your answers around the tips we will give you here, based on your skills and experience, of course. By doing so, you will feel more confident and stress-free in your interview. So let's begin and lay out the most commonly asked interview questions that will play a huge role in determining your future. 1. One of the first questions you can expect in an interview is tell me about yourself. Although this seems to be easy, there are a few tips to remember while answering this. Through this question, highlight your education, experience, and hobbies. Don't get too personal while answering this. Simultaneously, make sure to highlight your qualities. Another question that is commonly asked is what is your strength and weakness? This is generally asked to check if you as an individual can identify what you lack and at the same time, understand what you think is a positive trait that you own. We suggest you break this answer into two parts and speak about your strengths first. Do not be overly confident while listing out your strengths as it can always backfire you. A few good strengths that an interviewer seems fit will be flexibility, teamwork, attention to detail, and so on. You can add whatever else you feel is correct for you. However, don't keep the list too long and brag about yourself. Coming to your weaknesses, you don't have to be very hard on yourself. Think of a particular weakness that also seems to be beneficial in some way. For example, you could say that your attention to detail trait can at times be a disadvantage as you tend to spend more time and deep dive when issues crop up. So this won't be just a weakness since it carries a positive side as well. There are instances where the interviewers ask you if you have overcome your weaknesses. Make sure to mention that you are working on it and trying to improve. 3. Another tricky question can be why do you want this job? It can also be rephrased as why should we hire you? What interests you about this role? This is an answer that you can ace if you plan it well. Through your answer, you can get an opportunity to show what you know about the job you are applying for and the company. Be accurate with your answers, list a few aspects of the job role that appeals to you the most, and speak about ways to contribute to this role. Carrying out good research on the company and understanding the job description will help you answer this question. Mention specific points that will convince the hiring manager that you are a good fit for this particular job. Make sure that you don't sound arrogant at the same time, not too modest. In reality, you might just want the job to fill a career gap for the money. However, it is best if you don't say that and instead polish your answers around these tips. 
four. So the next question you can expect is why did you leave your last job? This question might seem a little awkward and can get you. Job seekers get nervous, but don't worry, we'll give you a few tips to maneuver through this. So if you were fired from your last job, it is best if you own up to it and tell them what you learned from that experience and how you have to overcome those issues right now. You might think it's best not to tell the truth here, but that's a bad idea as companies can always do a background check and know the reality. And when that happens, it won't leave a good impression. We all make mistakes and hence it is okay to own up to it as long as you are fixing those mistakes right now. So in cases where you have voluntarily left your previous job, explain why. You can mention points like you were looking for a different challenge and indirectly map it with the new position you're interviewing for. You could also say how the new company you are interviewing for has been one of the dream companies and so on. If there are other reasons for it, like budget cuts or economic issues, you can mention those as well. However, at no point should you be speaking wrong of your last company or your previous management. Don't make statements like how boring or mundane your previous job was. Try to answer this question with positivity only. Five, another question that could be asked is what is your greatest accomplishment at work? Here, you can pick an accomplishment that displays the right set of qualities that the company values and those that match the role you're interviewing for. Pick a single accomplishment that you feel will have the most impact. Another way this question can be asked is, describe a difficult work situation and how you handled it. This question is asked to assess how well you work in a tough situation and your approach. For this, you need to have a well-thought-out success story ready. Think of an instance wherein you successfully dealt with a problem all by yourself. Take a story that exhibits your skills to be an asset to the job you're interviewing for. First mention the situation, then move on to the task and action you carried out. Finally, speak about how fruitful the result was. You could speak about a situation wherein your boss was away and how you single-handedly handled issues of a client who was on the verge of leaving and so on. Basically, through your answer, the interviewer wishes to see how fit you are to handle any problem that could arise. Make sure to be precise with your answer. Display how passionate you are and that you are a problem solver. Six, moving on to the next question, how do you handle stress and pressure? Don't fall under pressure while answering this question and instead respond calmly. To begin with, don't say that you don't get stressed. As fascinating as that sounds, it is unbelievable since we are all humans indeed. Being overconfident this way will make the interviewer suspicious. Every job comes with its own kind of tension and pressure. This question is asked to know how work pressure affects you and your approach to it. The best way to plan this answer is by providing examples of how you've handled work pressure and stress in the past and how that's molded you for the better. For example, speak about how good pressure can help you. You could say having pressure keeps you motivated and more productive. Mention that the best way you overcome stress is by creating a well-planned schedule that will help you complete the assigned project before the deadline. This shows that you turn stress into action and take it positively to accomplish your tasks. Seven, our seventh question is about your goals. You can be asked, where do you see yourself in five years? Your answer to this question analyzes your commitment to the company. Don't mention how you wish to be the CEO of the company you are interviewing for. That makes it look too unrealistic. Be grounded while answering this question. For example, speak of how you wanna break the next five years into phases. In the first couple of years, mention how you want to learn everything about your job and acquire new skills. After which, in the next few years, mention how you wish to be in a position to help other team members and the company with your skills and the acquired knowledge. This way, you are showing that you wish to learn and grow at the same time. Another question that can be asked on the same lines is, what are your future goals? This is also asked to determine whether you will stick with a company in the long term. This question also analyzes your ambitions and how you forecast your career. You could answer this in the same way as the mentioned previously. Before answering, do try to understand what you want for yourself and see if the job role you're applying for helps you reach your ultimate desired goals. Eight, our next question is, what can you do for us that other candidates can't? This question is asked bluntly to distinguish yourself from other candidates. It is not very simple to answer this question, hence plan it beforehand. This question can be answered on the lines of your strength and how you stand out from the rest of the pack. At no time should you be critical of other candidates. 
all you need to do is speak about yourself. Emphasize any special certifications that you have, your prior industry experience, or you could speak about your strong interpersonal skills. In the end, you can mention that the combination of these skills can add great value to the team you will be working with. Remember to keep it precise and don't compare yourself with other candidates and instead highlight your qualities and skills. 9. Our next question is, what salary are you seeking? Or what are your salary expectations? This is asked to check if your salary expectations match the company's amount budgeted for the role you are applying for. To be able to answer this, you need to know your worth. Hence, research the salary range of your role in your area and have an idea about it before replying to this question. For example, if you give a range that is way higher or lower than the market value, it looks like you are unaware of your worth. You could wish to ask for a higher side of the market range, however, you must clearly show that you are flexible and salary can be negotiable. You could also be careful and instead ask for the employer what range they are looking to pay someone your background typically has. This way, you will know what the employer has in his or her mind and speak around that. 10. Our final question is very common. Do you have any questions for me? Usually, the interviewer concludes by asking you if you have any questions for them. Now is the right time for you to clarify your doubts and ask questions. Make sure to ask good and relevant questions. This displays the seriousness you have towards the job. Firstly, if you have any doubts or questions in mind regarding the job role and your day-to-day -day responsibilities, feel free to ask. Secondly, it is good if you ask about the company's culture. Lastly, you can ask questions regarding the opportunities you will be getting for the professional development in this particular role. It is of utmost importance that you are convinced about the job role and its growth to go ahead. This is the time for you to decide as well if you want this job or not. Based on the interviewer's reply, you can decide if that particular job is good or not for your career. Avoid asking too many questions and questions about off-work activities. Remember that every question you ask shows your seriousness. Hence, avoid asking silly, time-wasting questions. So, those were the top 10 commonly asked interview questions. Now you know the kind of questions you have to review and prepare for before your next interview. Pause and think about it before you respond to any questions. Keep these steps in mind and frame your answers accordingly. Following these steps will surely help you stand out from the crowd. Where do you see yourself in five years? Ever heard of this interview question? I'm sure you must have. This is one of the most frequently asked questions. So what does the interviewer keep in mind while asking you this? What is your safe answer? The answer to this can get quite delicate and can set you apart from the other candidates. Here we are to help you answer this question smoothly. Before answering this question, you need to understand what the interviewer wants to know while asking you such a question. When you are asked where you see yourself in five years, it is nothing but a question about your career goals. Employers want to learn about your goals and see if it fits with the job they're offering. Interviewers wish to know if this job role will satisfy you and that you'll work hard and stay with the company for a long time. They want to assess you on your vision, ambitions, and career outlook. They wish to see if you have realistic expectations of your career and if this particular position aligns with your goals overall. You must think about how this job aligns with your broader professional goals. Most jobs need training. No employer would be interested in investing their time and money in a candidate who is planning to leave. Hence, companies hire good prospects for their businesses. Those who are genuinely enthusiastic about the job and those who are truly dependable. You should give an honest answer to this question, but make sure to present your answer well in a way that can help you get hired. You must make sure to think about your goals before formulating an answer to the interview. Think of this question as an opportunity for you to do a bit of career planning and answer the question. By developing your answer to this question, you can get an insight into your career direction. However, a wrong answer to this question can wreck an opportunity for you. So, how to answer this question rightly? Here are a few magic tips to help you. First and foremost, do not answer this question with an I don't know and avoid joking. This shows you that you have no seriousness towards this job in your career. Employers want to see if this job truly matters to you or not. It shouldn't look like this job is just a way to pass your time or an opportunity to break your unemployment. Secondly, when answering, it is best if you stay grounded and not bring up unrealistic expectations. 
For example, do not say things like you see yourself as a COO or a CMO in the next five years. That will give the employer a feeling that you are over ambitious and that you may not be happy if the growth doesn't escalate to that speed. Very few employers will be interested in hiring you then. Such an answer will also make your current job just a stepping stone and not something you truly want. Hence, refrain from speaking about promotions or seeing your job roles and rather stay grounded. Finally, what are you supposed to say then? How are you supposed to answer the question? One quick tip is that you must present your answers as actions and not goals. When answering this question, it is advised that you break this question into parts. One as a short-term goal and another as a long-term goal. This will help you channelize your answer and provide good clarity to the interviewer. For example, you can say something on these grounds. For the next couple of years, I would like to immerse myself in this job and improve my skills around it. After which, I would like to take up additional responsibilities and help others in the organization with my expertise. When you say this, it shows how solely focused you are on this role, how excited you are to learn new skills. And at the same time, it also shows that your learning will help the company in the future. Make sure to mention a set of actions you will undertake to help facilitate your growth and not the final goal by itself. The bottom line, an employer wants to see your future goals and see if it will align with the company's needs. By doing so, they will understand if you are an asset to the company or not. Preparing for this question is a great exercise in understanding what you like doing and what is genuinely meaningful to you in the future. Take the time to think about what you want in life and present your answer well. This way, there are more chances for you to be hired, and you will also be happy about where you will be in the next five years. The appraisal season is just around the corner, but are you prepared for your appraisal discussion yet? Most often, even the thought of appraisal discussion can cause anxiety to many. However, it can be positive and stress-free if you prepare beforehand. Here are a few tips and tricks that will help you prepare and rock this important discussion. Firstly, before you enter the discussion room, make sure you have carried out an honest self-evaluation. Be cognizant of how well you have achieved your previous goals. Take responsibility in case there were any misses. Evaluate your strengths, development areas, and how well you have worked on your past feedback. Since we live in a data-driven world, our next tip for you is to walk into your appraisal discussion with data points. It is impressive if you support your accomplishments with foolproof documents. List your achievements in terms of numbers. This is where you get the opportunity to tell why you deserve a good appraisal with data to support your claim. Ensure you have a meeting objective. It could be about promotions, pay hikes, or new projects. During the meeting, it is natural to have a conversation about your career goals. Have a healthy conversation about your goals with your manager and ask how you can improve. You could also pursue certifications to increase your skill set and let your employer know that you are interested and capable of taking up bigger roles for the team and the business. Note that appraisal discussions are a two-way dialogue. The employers provide their feedback as well. So if you get positive feedback, well and good, pat yourself. This gives you an opportunity to articulate your value and put forward your request. On the other hand, if you get negative feedback, you should calmly ask your manager to explain why they feel so. Do not argue, instead listen and understand how you can improve. Our final tip to you is to walk into that appraisal discussion with a positive mindset. Be confident and have an open mind. Remember, it is in your hands to manage your performance and career development well. Do you know what sets you apart from the rest of the others as an employee or as a job seeker? It is your set of soft skills. More often than not, many of us overlook the importance of soft skills and pay more attention to hard skills and experience. However, soft skills are vital for an employee and for that matter, for every individual. This video will list a set of soft skills that will help you grow in your career. So what are soft skills? These are skills that refer to various personality traits such as attitude, communication, critical thinking, time management, creative abilities, etc. 
Soft skills help in capitalizing on your potential and help you stand out. All those educational certifications don't matter if you are poor at these soft skills. Hence, you must groom your soft skills. After careful analysis, we list the top five most important soft skills a job seeker or an employee must have. One, first and foremost, you must possess good communication skills, both written and verbal. Being a good communicator is crucial in any workplace. Having strong communication will boost your chances of building healthy relationships with your coworkers. You can enhance your communication and presentation skills by joining various public speaking workshops. Two, next up is your adaptability. One thing you should always remember is that your work might not go as planned. Hence, you need to be flexible and be adaptable to accommodate new changes and find alternate solutions. To be adaptable, you need to be an adopter for change and keep up with the pace the world runs at. Employers look for professionals who are capable of meeting new challenges and who create new benchmarks. Three, third in our list is problem solving and critical thinking. So what do you do when you confront a problem in your workplace? Do you crib about it or do you look for a solution? Hope your answer is to look for a solution because that is exactly what you get noticed and make you an asset in an organization. To be a problem solver, always think of solutions and not the problem. Critical thinking is also another important skill. You need to bring new perspectives and well thought out solutions to help the company progress. To do this well, learn to analyze and critically observe every situation. Four, next on our list is teamwork. The success of every company depends on the hard work of all of its employees. Every employee is different and each of them has their own set of strengths. It works best for an organization when all the employees collaborate and capitalize on their talents and work together towards a common goal. This way, everyone wins. Office culture also primarily depends on team players. Furthermore, you should always be able to collaborate well with your coworkers, which strengthens your work quality. To be a good team player, always extend a helping hand to your colleagues, which will surely help you someday. Five, the last skill set on our list is time management. The old saying goes, time and tide wait for no man is indeed very true. Every job has its tight deadlines and pressure. Employers look for candidates who can deliver good results within a stipulated time and set stress aside. Nobody wants to have an employee who doesn't meet deadlines. Yes, you should do your work well, but at the same time, keep in mind the deadlines. You must be able to manage your time well to provide fruitful results. Time management can also help when you work under pressure. If you efficiently organize and prioritize your task, you will manage your time well and deliver your work on time. This way, your employer will have faith in you and give you more crucial responsibilities. So those were our set of the top five soft skills every professional must have. Apart from these skills, it would be best if you always remember to carry a positive attitude. Even when things might fall apart, it is of utmost importance that you carry a positive outlook, which will surely help you overcome your problems. Soft skills help build a reputation, opening the door to more opportunities that you can ever imagine. So don't just rely on those educational certificates to grow in your career. Instead, make sure that you incorporate these soft skills and you will surely see how different your life will be. Did you know that an average person spends nearly 90,000 hours of his or her life at work? Therefore, choosing the type of work you'll do is arguably one of the most important decisions you can ever make. And it is difficult to make this decision with the different available options today. So here we are to help you with that. By the end of this video, you will have a clear understanding of how to choose the right career. So stay tuned till the end. Our first tip is to carry a self-evaluation to understand what kind of career aligns with your personality. You must ask yourself a set of questions to identify your strengths, passion, and interests because no one can do this better. Doing this will also open doors to some natural talents that you might have overlooked. So the questions that you need to ask yourself are 1. What natural aptitudes define you most? 2. What domain fascinates you? 3. What are the pros and cons while working in a domain that you like? While reflecting on these questions, pick a pen and paper and start jotting down your answers. If you are confused about what you are good at, take an inventory of what others tell you. 
After understanding your strengths and interests, our next tip is for you to explore job roles that align with your skill set. Start looking for occupations that sound interesting or desirable to you. Match descriptions of those job roles with the skill set you have discovered in the previous step. Once you have gathered all the potential options, put them in a rough order according to how well they satisfy the factors listed previously. While exploring different job roles, make sure to read the job descriptions thoroughly, as their titles don't always represent the actual job flawlessly. Once you have explored all the jobs that seem interesting, shortlist a set of the ideal career possibilities. Eliminate each career path that has weak job outlooks. Check for parameters like growth opportunities and salary. Terminate those career options which are unable to match your expectations. With these filters help, you should shorten your preference list to a maximum of three choices, as it is impossible to consider every career option. As of now, you have accumulated the best career paths that are the most appropriate for you. So it's time to assess whether you need additional training to pursue your chosen career. These days, many recruiters expect freshers to have some hands-on experience so that they can directly hit the flow. In addition to that, training and certifications can also help you strengthen your resume. So gather specific details about the technical skill set required for the job carefully and fulfill them. Once you have determined that you are well qualified for a particular career path, make sure to add relevant projects to your resume to reflect your command over the required skill set for that specific career path. Finally, after doing all of the research, you are ready with authentic career choices that can make you feel content while working. So the next step is to apply for your dream job. During the whole hiring process, the only obstacle standing between you and your career is the interview. Our last tip to you is to ace the interview. Carry out good research about the company and be confident throughout the interview process. Once you clear the interview round, you will land with your fulfilling job role. Now pay attention to the parts of your job that you are enjoying. Also keep gathering new information about your role. Remember, your job will remain satisfactory only if you continue growing. For that to happen, design your goals and keep track of them. If you feel that your current career is no longer aligning with what you want to do in the future, then consider shifting your tasks or looking for other roles from your list of career choices that might be a better fit for you. By being self-aware, eventually you will end up with cheerful and fulfilling career options, so keep striving more in your career as it is crucial for your individual growth. Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1,000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Technology has grown much in the present and is making a significant impact on all the careers. All those technologies came from developing new software and products that require a lot of coding and programming. Coding and programming are the means that help in the development of software and products. So what is coding? Coding is a process of passing instructions to communicate with the computer using programming languages. It also helps to pass actions and methods to the computer and instructs what to do and how to do it in a detailed manner. Moving forward, let's understand how to start coding. There are a number of ways to learn coding, like learning from online blogs, online podcasts, communities or group of coders on social media and other platforms, YouTube videos, Stack Overflow, GitHub, self-designed projects and portfolios, online bootcamps, online hackathons and many more. Let's have a look over some top ways to learn coding and we have online bootcamps, YouTube videos, social media, real-time projects, events and coding challenges, development tools, GitHub and Stack Overflow. Now let's understand each one of them in detail. In these pandemic situations, the possibility to learn coding through institutions or other ways is much more difficult. To overcome these situations, online bootcamps have mainly come into focus. These are helping the students and old professionals to learn coding quite easily without any hassle. There are thousands of online bootcamps available on the internet to learn coding. 
there are many challenges and projects available on the internet to make it easy for everyone to learn coding. These boot camps also provide some related certifications on the course and repeat. These online boot camps also provide some related certifications on the course you have studied, which is a huge benefit of learning coding. And the next one in the list is YouTube videos. YouTube has become the best platform to learn coding. There are many videos available on YouTube about coding. They upload videos with different content and provide a different aspect. YouTube provides and has videos with different content and helps to get certified and improve in getting more command over coding. There are many challenges, live classes and webinars in various languages to help and make it easy to learn coding. And the next one in the list is social media. In this modern world, the growth of social media is increasing rapidly because of the advantages it has. This helps everyone from various perspectives. The social media will help learn coding by promoting a number of videos and information about the latest technologies which can show more impact in less time. These also help in uploading the videos and providing the details of the latest courses and technologies. Social media can be easily available in every kind of situation. And the next one in the list is real-time projects. Real-time projects help in learning coding skills and improve the knowledge and concentration towards coding. Projects usually involve a team which can be a huge benefit in learning coding. If any question or problem arises, it can be easy for discussing with the team which improves the coding knowledge. Another huge benefit in working with real-time projects is improving communication skills which helps in increasing the concentration over coding. And the next one in the list is events and coding challenges. Thousands of events and coding challenges are available on the internet. These are a huge benefit to learn coding. These provide you with an idea about how the code should be written according to the challenges and helps to get more command over coding. Once you are capable of solving the challenges and events, then it is easy for you to implement code and program. These skills can help you improve in your debugging and development speed which can be a massive advantage in starting to learn coding. And the next one in the list is development tools. Development tools involve various tools with different development, which helps you to work under multiple programming languages. Once you get in touch with all the tools you're working on, you can get a good idea of how to learn and the requirements you should follow to get more attention. These tools are much more helpful in improving your coding skills and get more command over different coding and programming languages. The next one in the list is GitHub. GitHub is a web-based internet provider used for internet hosting, for software development and version control of Git. GitHub facilitates social coding by providing a web interface to the Git code repository and management tools for collaboration. GitHub can be thought of a serious social networking site for software developers. GitHub is so intuitive to use and its version control tools are so helpful for collaboration. Non-programmers have also begun to use GitHub to work on document-based and multimedia projects. The final one in the list is the Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is the largest and most popular and preferred online community to learn coding. Stack Overflow is the largest and most popular and preferred online community to learn coding. It is filled with questions and answers on a wide range of topics in computer programming, for professional and enthusiastic programmers. Examples of code and explanation is provided in a proper way that can help in growing your knowledge on coding and help to understand quickly. And these are a few ways to learn coding. And now let's have a look over some of the top platforms to learn coding. So some of the top platforms to learn coding are the first one, Scale Up. Scale Up platform is offered by Simply Learn Solutions Private Limited, which was founded by Mr. Krishna Kumar. It offers free online courses for those who are looking for better content. The main goal through SkillUp is to build strong foundational skills for career growth. SkillUp also offers live webinars with the professionals to help in the growth of technology. Next, we have W3Schools. W3Schools is a freemium educational website to learn coding derived from the World Wide Web created in the year 1998. This is one of the top websites for learning coding, mainly for people looking for some content and grip over the subject, which involves beginner to advanced. And the next platform we have is HackerRank. 
HackerRank is a technical company that focuses on the competitive programming challenges for both consumers and businesses. It helps in hiring for other companies and helps in delivering good content. It includes Java, C++, PHP, Python, SQL, JavaScript and spans multiple computer science domains. And the next platform on the list is LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning is an American website offering video courses by industry experts in software, creativity and business skills. All these courses on LinkedIn fall into three categories, business, creative and technology. It was founded in the year 1995 by Linda Winman as lynda.com. All the courses on LinkedIn fall into three categories, business, creative and technology. It was founded in the year 1995 by Linda Winman as lynda.com. There are 15,000 plus courses and learning paths offered by LinkedIn Learning. It is a subsidiary of LinkedIn. These are a few platforms to learn coding for free. Now, let's have a look at some of the new programming languages. The new programming languages are leading in the present situations and they are helping a lot in development and growth of software. Now, let's have a look at some of the topmost languages and trends we have. So we have Python, Java, JavaScript, Go, Swift, and R. Let's have a look at some of them in brief. First, we have Python. Python is the most preferred programming language because of the syntax of Python programming can be easy to understand for every programmer. And this programming language is also loaded with full of libraries that help in implementing scientific computing. Working and deployment in Python are supportive and easy in any kind of environment. Next one in the list is Java. In the modern time, Java is the best language to choose. Nearly thousands of applications, software and development tools are built using the Java programming language. This technology is mostly used in creating websites such as YouTube, Google, Amazon and much more. The third one in the list is JavaScript. JavaScript is responsible for fast and secure development. The main advantage and perspective are to provide more interactivity with the users and coders. It also helps in expanding innovative technologies which involve animation, gaming and rendering. And the fourth one in the list is Go. Go language helps in building software in a simple, reliable and efficient way. This language also helps to add more cash for the processor to improve the performance of the application. Go language is also used for advanced networking and other multi-core processing. And the fifth one in the list is Swift. Swift language is easy to understand and implement because of the syntax which is quite simple. Swift is less error prone because of the inline support. Swift language improves the development speed which has a considerable advantage in reducing the issues related to the cost. The last one in the list is R. R language is very scalable and makes it easy to build aesthetic web applications. This language is mainly developed by using statistics and data science knowledge. R acts as a cross-platform programming language because of the ability to run on any operating system. And these are a few languages that are in the huge demand at present. Now let's have a look at the top jobs and their salaries. There are a thousand jobs available in the world if you have a good command of coding. In this session, we bought some of the top jobs leading from the front with their salaries. The first one is data scientist. Next we have machine learning expert, Python developer, cloud architect and big data engineer. Now, let's get a brief about the specialities, skills and salaries. Let's have a look at the top job for the session and we have data scientist. A data scientist is a professional who gathers and analyzes large sets of data. Data scientists also process and help in involving complex problems. They should have some skills like Python, R and Java. Data scientists earn $96,048 per annum in the United States of America and in India, it is around 42 lakhs 80,000 rupees per annum. That's an average count. Now, next in the number two we have is machine learning experts. A machine learning engineer is responsible for building algorithms to train models. He is also responsible for performing solutions for complex problems. They should have skills like Python, machine learning and R. Machine learning engineers earn an average salary of $85,736 per annum in the United States of America and around 3 lakhs per annum in India. And these numbers are just for beginners. Next at number 3 we have Python developer. Python developers develop web and software applications and integrate user-facing elements into applications. 
They also help and instruct the organizations with logical frameworks. They should have skills like Python, web frameworks, and analytics. Python developers earn an average salary of $90,100 per annum in United States of America and around 3,90,000 rupees per annum in India. And these salaries are beginners and the number could vary according to your experience and expertise. At number 4, we have Cloud Architect. A cloud architect is an information technology expert who works on cloud application design. They also work with the DevOps engineers and develop to build the right technology. They should have skills like AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. Cloud architects earn around $2,40,000 per annum in the United States of America and anything around 19 lakhs per annum in India. And at fifth role, we have the big data engineer. Big data has been a revolution in every business sector. He is responsible for storing, processing, and analyzing the huge data. They design and develop significant data architecture. They should have skills like Hadoop, Apache Spark, and SQL. Big data engineers earn around $1,7,000 per annum in the United States of America and around rupees in India. So these are some of the top jobs at present. Now let's understand the benefits of learning coding. Coding and programming are playing a massive role in the present day-to-day -day life. They are showing the capability to do anything in the present. Let's see some of the benefits of learning coding. Programming and coding help in improving creativity. While dealing with the applications and projects, they use much creativity to develop those and require a lot of creative knowledge, which helps in situations like problem solving. Using these, it is easy to find solutions to complex problems perfectly. Most jobs in the present are dependent on technology. Coding helps to find jobs quite easily and impact career growth. Coding skills also help in improving resilience skills, which can be a huge advantage. Today we'll be discussing about the coding interview questions. We will begin this video with some conceptual questions about data structures, algorithms, and then move on to discussing the coding problems that are most commonly asked to solve in the interviews. These questions will help you summarize every important programming concept and serve as a perfect preparation resource for coding interviews. By the end of this video, I can assure you that you will have a proper understanding of data structure concepts and you will be able to code the most common problems asked in the interviews. Now let's begin with the top 40 coding interview questions that you should know. Programming interview questions are an integral part of an interview for the developer's position. No matter which programming language you master, it is expected that you are familiar with the fundamental concepts of the programming. Coding skills are always the deciding factor in any programming interview. We will discuss the top 40 coding interview questions. You should absolutely know how to crack in interviews to get your dream job. So without further ado, let's get started. So as discussed, the first part would be the conceptual interview questions. And in that, the first question we have to face is, what is a data structure? So the answer for this question is, a data structure is a storage format that defines the way the data is stored, organized, and manipulated. Some popular data structures are arrays, trees, and graphs. Moving ahead, we have our next question, that is, what is an array? So basically, all the items that an array stores are of the same data type. It organizes data so that a related set of values can be easily sorted or searched. Now followed by an array, the next question we have is about the linked list. So what is a linked list? It is completely similar to array, but there are some basic differences. Like an array, a linked list is a linear data structure in which elements are not necessarily stored in a continuous manner. So linked list is basically a sequence of nodes where each node points to the next node forming a chain-like structure. So followed by the linked list, we have the next question which is based on stacks. So what exactly is a stack? Stack is a linear data structure that performs operations in a leaf or order. So in a stack, elements can only be accessed starting from the topmost to the bottom element. So followed by stacks, we have our next question which is what is a LIFO? So basically LIFO stands for last in, first out. So it is a way of accessing, storing and retrieving data. The data that was stored at the last is extracted at the first. The next one after LIFO is a queue. So what exactly is a queue? Queue is a linear data structure that performs operations in a FIFO order. So basically FIFO is first in, first out. In a queue, the least recently added elements are removed first as opposite to the stack. 
So up next we have the FIFO. So what exactly is FIFO? FIFO stands for first in, first out. It is a way of accessing, storing and retrieving data. The data that was stored first is extracted first. The next question is about the binary trees. So what exactly are binary trees? A binary tree is an extension of linked list data structure where each node has two children. Binary tree has two nodes at all the times, a left node and a right node. So these left and right nodes for the top node are known as children of the top node. Next we have is recursion. So what is recursion? Recursion refers to a function calling itself based on a terminating condition. It uses last and first start functionality and therefore makes use of the stack data structure. Followed by recursion, we have the OOPS. So what is the OOPS concept? OOPS stands for Object Oriented Programming System, a paradigm that provides concepts such as objects, classes, inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, etc. So what are the concepts introduced in OOPS? So the following concepts are introduced in OOPS. They are object, class, inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction and encapsulation. Now we will discuss each one of them in a bit more detail. So we will begin with object. A real world entity having a particular state and a behavior is called as an object. It can be defined as an instance of a class. So next we have the class. A logical entity that defines the blueprint from which an object can be created or instantiated is called as a class. So basically class is a blueprint which we use to create an object. So followed by classes and objects we have the Inheritance, a concept that refers to an object acquiring all the properties and behaviors of a parent object is called as inheritance. So basically inheritance provides code reusability. So followed by inheritance, the next important concept we have is the polymorphism. So polymorphism is a concept that allows the task to be performed in different ways. In Java, we use method overloading and method overriding to achieve polymorphism. Followed by polymorphism, we have the abstraction, a concept that hides the internal details of an application and shows only the functionality is called as abstraction. In Java, we use abstract classes and interface to achieve abstraction. The last one is the encapsulation. Encapsulation is a concept that refers to wrapping of code and data together into a single unit. So basically, every code we have in the Java will have data members and data manipulating methods. So encapsulation is a basic concept that brings them together and binds them as a single unit. So followed by OOPS concepts, the next important question that we will be facing is about the binary search tree. So explain binary search tree. A binary search tree stores data in such a way that it can be retrieved very efficiently. Next, the left subtree contains nodes whose keys are less than that of the node's key value. The right subtree contains nodes whose keys are greater than or equal to the node's key value. Followed by that, the next question we have is the doubly linked list. So what exactly are doubly linked lists? The doubly linked lists are special type of linked list in which traversal across the data elements can be done in both directions. This is made possible by having two links in which one of the node will be connected to the next upcoming node and the other link is connected to the previous node. So followed by the doubly linked list, the next important question we have is the graph. So what exactly is a graph? A graph is one type of data structure that contains a set of ordered pairs. So these ordered pairs are also referred as edges or arcs and arcs are used to connect nodes where data can be stored or retrieved. So followed by this we have our next question that is called as the difference between linear and non-linear data structures. So the first difference is the linear data structure in which data elements are adjacent to each other and the non-linear data structure is a structure in which each element can connect to two adjacent data elements. Followed by that, the next difference is examples of linear data structure are the arrays, linked list, stacks and others like queues and examples for non-linear data structures are trees and graphs. Followed by that, the next question is what is a DQ? So a DQ is a double-ended queue and this is a structure in which elements can be inserted or removed from either end. Followed by that, we have our next question which says the difference between the stack and an array. 
So stack follows a LIFO pattern. It means that the data access follows a sequence in which the last data to be stored is the first element to be extracted. Next we have the array. Arrays on the other hand do not follow a particular order and instead can be accessed by referring the indexed element within the array. Followed by that the next question is which sorting algorithm is the best? There are many types of sorting algorithms like quick sort, bubble sort, balloon sort, radix sort, merge sort etc. And no algorithm can be considered as the best or the fastest because each is designed for a specific type of data structure where it performs the best. And our 19th question is how does variable declaration affect memory? So the amount of memory can be allocated or reserved depends on the data type being stored in that variable. For example, if a variable is declared to be integer type, then 32 bits of memory storage will be reserved for that variable. So the 28th question is, what are dynamic data structures? So dynamic data structures are the data structures that expand and contract as the program runs. It provides a flexible means of manipulating data because it can adjust according to the size of the data. So these were the conceptual based questions so far we discussed now. Next we will move ahead into the programming interview questions. So at first we have how do you reverse a string in Java? So you can see on my screen we have a code segment that is capable of reversing a string. So basically you declare a string then take the length of that string, loop through the characters of the string and add these characters in the reverse order then print the resultant string. Next we have how do you determine if a string is a palindrome or not? So for that particular question we have a code segment which is capable to reverse the string and check if it is a palindrome or not and accordingly provide the result. So a string is a palindrome when it stays the same on the reversing order of characters in that string. It is achieved by reversing the original string first and then checking if the reverse string is equal to the original string or not. Followed by that we have the 23rd question that says find the number of occurrences of a string character in a string. So the following code segment is capable to find that particular task and to find the number of occurrences of loop through the string and search for that character in every iteration whenever it is found then the count will be updated. Followed by that the 24th question is find if the given two strings are anagrams or not. Two strings are considered as anagrams if they contain similar group of characters in varied sequence. So for finding out if two strings are anagrams or not, we have the code segment on the right part of my screen right now. So basically you declare a boolean value that tells the end of the two strings are anagrams or not. Then first check the length of the both strings if they are same or not. Then if they are not same, then they are not anagrams. If they are same, then they are anagrams like they might be a chance of being the two strings as anagrams and followed by the next step is convert both the strings to character arrays then sort them out and finally check the sorted arrays if they are equal or not if they are equal then print their anagrams and if they are not equal then you should print not anagrams the next 25th question is how do you calculate the number of vowels and consonants in a string so you can see on my screen I have a code segment which will be capable of counting vowels and consonants in a string. So loop through the string so that's the first step followed by that increase the vowel variable by one whenever the character can be found as a vowel using the if condition otherwise increment the consonant variable. Finally print the values of both the vowels and consonants count. The next important question we will be facing in the coding interview is how do you get matching elements in an integer array? So for that we have a code segment on my screen right away. Now the steps for that are declare an array, nest a couple of loops and compare the numbers with the other numbers in the array and finally print the matching elements whenever found. So next we have this 27th question that says code bubble sort algorithm. You don't have to code the entire bubble sort algorithm. What you can do is just write the code segment which has a logic for it. So that is currently on my screen right now. So what you basically do is declare an array. So next what you do is nest a couple of loops and compare the numbers in that array and then the array will be sorted in the ascending order by replacing the elements if found in any other order. 28th question is code the insertion sort algorithm. So this is completely similar approach. What we followed for the bubble sort you just have to write the code segment of logic. So the steps will be first the element in the array is assumed to be sorted. Take the second element and then store it separately in key. Now the first two elements are like sorted. 
take the third element and then compare it with the elements in the left of it. The process goes on until the array is sorted. So next we have the 29th question, how do you reverse an array? So you can see on my screen we have a code segment that says how to reverse an array. Loop till the half length of the array. Next we have to replace the numbers corresponding to the indexes from the starting to the end. Followed by that we have the 30th question where we have to find a way to swap two numbers without the third variable. So this type of interview question will be asked most number of times to the beginners most frequently. Now the solution for that has been written on my screen right away. You can check out that and the steps to be followed are declare two variables and initialize them with the values. Make B the sum of both the numbers then subtract the sum that is the B from A. So A is now swapped. Lastly, subtract A from the sum B. So B is now also swapped. Next we have the 31st question which says print a Fibonacci series using recursion. So for that we have a code segment which can print a Fibonacci series on my screen right now. So the code on my screen can be used to print the Fibonacci series. So basically what are Fibonacci numbers? So the Fibonacci numbers are the numbers in the following integer sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21 and so on. They can be calculated using the mathematical formula used in the Fibonacci recursive function. The next question you'll be facing is how do you find the factorial of an integer? So we have the code segment on my screen which can perform the factorial of an integer operation. So the factorial is a function that multiplies a number by every number below it. For example, factorial of 5 is 5 into 4 into 3 into 2 into 1 which is equals to 120. So recursive function multiplies the number until it reaches 1. The next one is how do you reverse a linked list? So for that we have the code segment on my screen right away. You can please check it out and try it. So if you can find out if it can reverse a linked list or not. So the steps to be done for that are declare a linked list first. Then add elements to that linked list. Apply the descending iterator method to the linked list. And then this should reverse the order of the elements in the linked list. The 34th question is how do you implement a binary search? So for that we have the code segment right on my screen. You can check that out and the steps to be followed are mentioned in the code segment. So the binary search divides the array into half in every iteration step until it finds the element. It works on sorted arrays since it compares the values of adjacent elements and then calculates the middle number. If the value of low becomes greater than high at any point it means the element is not present in the list. So this is how the binary search basically works. Followed by that we have the 35th question which says find the second largest number in the array. So you can see we have a code segment on my screen to find it out. So the steps to be followed are loop through the array. If the value of i is greater than the highest store the value of i in the highest and store the value of highest in the second highest variable. So now let's move ahead to the 36th question. How do you remove all occurrences of a given character from the input string? So we have a simple small code segment on my screen right away. So that code segment can be used to remove all the occurrences of a given character from an input string. So what you can do is use the built in string method that is replace to replace a character with any other character including symbols and white spaces. So followed by that we have our 37th question. So that is showcase inheritance with the help of a program. So we have a small code segment on my screen to showcase the one of the major object oriented programming method that is inheritance. So the class cat inherits the property color from class animal by extending the parent class animal. This way a class cat can have more parent classes if it wishes to inherit their properties as well. So next question that is the 38th question is explain overloading and overriding with the help of a program. So this is a major question which is asked many number of times most frequently for the beginners and sometimes even the experienced candidates cannot escape this question. So first we'll discuss overloading. When a class has two or more methods with the same name they are called as overloaded methods. So you can see a code segment on the right side part of my screen right away. So this is an example for overloading. Next we will discuss the overriding. So next we will discuss the overriding. 
So when a super class method is also implemented in the child class, then it's a clear case of overriding. So on the right side part of my screen, you can see a code segment where a child class is extending the base class method, which is print name. Now followed by that, we have the 39th question. That is check if the given number is prime or not. So you can see a code segment on my screen, which determines if the given number is a prime number or not. So the steps to be followed to find if a given number is prime or not are use if statements to check for each condition separately. If the number is zero or one, it cannot be prime. If the number is two, it is prime. If the number is and finally, the third condition you need to take care of is if the number is indivisible by other numbers, then it is prime. So basically prime numbers are divisible by one or itself. If any other number is capable to divide the number, then it is not a prime number. Now the last question in the list is how do you sum all the elements in an array? So for that, we have a code segment right on my screen. Please check it and try to run it and that's the best way to learn. So the steps to be followed are use the loop to iterate through the array and keep adding the elements in that array. And finally, you'll get the sum of the elements in the array and you can just print this sum at the last. So with that, as you prepare for your upcoming job interview, we hope these coding questions have provided more insight into what types of questions you are likely to be asked. All right, that brings us to the end of this video tutorial on interview process full course by Simply Learn. I hope this video was useful and interesting. If you have any queries, please feel free to put them in the comment section of the video. Thank you for watching.